All right, in this video, we're going to talk about the metrics that we use for machine learning models. How do you know if a model's good or bad or you know, wonderful? What metrics do we use and how do we actually evaluate models? Okay, so how do we do it? Uh, well, if you've done any sort of curve fitting before in a math class, you probably used R squared. It's certainly the most common, right? For example, take this one. If you took this data and you fit this polynomial curve to it, we did a third order polynomial. It looks pretty darn good, right? It looks like it fit it. Um, if this was in Excel, you can click that box and have it show you the R squared value. That's certainly the most common tool that people use when they are developing metrics for these models is R squared. Now, in our last video, we showed you linear and nonlinear models. What's interesting and what I didn't realize before this is that you actually can't use R squared to evaluate nonlinear models. Some of the fundamental assumptions that go into how we calculate R squared are definitely not going to be valid for nonlinear equations. And so we need better metrics. In this video, we'll talk about R squared as well as a few others. Let's start with R squared because it's the one people are mostly familiar with. First off, R squared is actually, the term for it is called the coefficient of determination. Okay, if you pull it up on Wikipedia, you can see these nice graphs about it where they actually show you how you calculate it. First off, have you ever wondered why it's a percentage? Right? Why is it not like a number representing an error? It's, it's a percentage. So what is that? Well, it's a percentage because of how it gets calculated. It's defined as the proportion of the variation in your dependent variable, that's the y value, that can be attributed to the independent variables, right? So if they can completely describe the change in your y value, then you have a perfect fit, right? But if they can't completely describe how this thing goes up or down, the change, right, then there's, it's not a perfect model. It has some amount of imperfection. So the way they calculate this is by first calculating the average, right? So if you have a bunch of data points, we'll call those, you have y, you know, data. So y sub i is each individual data point in your data set y. If you go one by one through them and you do a summation and then you divide it by the number of entries, well, that's just the average. So y bar, y with the bar on top of it, that's your average value, right? Your median value in your data set. Well, you could then figure out what the error is associated with this, right? This would be called the residual. So your SS total, that would be taking each and one of these points and measuring its distance from the average, right? Yi minus y hat, the average value, and then you square that, right? So that's your sum squared total, hence the SS. It, you're summing up all these squares, right? So that would be these red, the area in red essentially is what that would be. Now we can compare that with the data point minus the predicted value. So if you did predictions, we'll call those F, where FI is each predicted data point. We're gonna take the difference from those and square it, and that's your sum squared, what we're gonna call residual, right? The actual point minus what you predicted. So that would be shown in these blue boxes, okay? So R squared is simply one minus your sum squared residual from your predictions divided by your sum squared total, which is just assuming that it's completely average, so all the variation coming from an average value. That's it, that's R squared. So that's uh, obviously the best it could be would be 100% when it fits it perfectly, the worst it could be would be 0%, okay? Uh, so one of the challenges, why this doesn't work for linear models is because again, R squared is defined as this proportion of the variation in your dependent variable that can be attributed to independent variables. Well, in linear models, we know that the total variance is equal to your error variance plus your explained variance, right? The stuff that can be explained by the parameters, that's your model, plus just error, right? But the problem is that for nonlinear models, this assumption is not true. The total variance is not equal to error of your variance plus your explained variance, right? It can be something totally different. And what it is equal to depends on what on earth kind of equation you came up with in your nonlinear equation. But the problem is that if that's not true, then R squared is no longer a number between zero and 100, right? And so you can get really crazy numbers and you don't know how to interpret them. Um, this has been pointed out by statisticians who have studied this. Uh, for example, check this paper out from 2010 in BMC Pharmacology. So people in the field of pharmacology you know, they were seeing many people using nonlinear models and then fitting it with R squared, and they just were bugged by that. So they said, look, this is a problem. So they went through and they carefully examined how R squared changes on linear versus nonlinear models on a bunch of different ones. And here's what they found. R squared is consistently high for both excellent and appalling models, meaning 
it, just because it's good doesn't mean that your fit is good. It's not like you fit your data well. It says R squareds won't even all rise for better models all the time. So if you move a model from bad to you know from bad to better, you should see a rise in R squared. But they don't they observe that that doesn't always happen. And then it says if you use the R squared to pick the best model, it leads to the proper model only you know less than half the, half the time you know, 28 to 43 percent of the time. So that's a problem. Here they, they say here, in the field of biochemical and pharmacological literature, there is a uh, reasonably high occurrence of the use of R squared as the basis for arguing against or in favor of different models. Additionally, almost all of the commercially available statistical software packages uh, calculate R squared for nonlinear fits. If you've used Excel and you did an exponential fit, right? <laughs> it's a nonlinear fit, and it'll still happily give you an R squared. And I've been happily interpreting that, you know, in a in probably an incorrect way. Anyway, it says which is bound to unintentionally corroborate its frequent use. As a result uh, from this work, we would like to advocate that R squared should not be reported or demanded in pharmacological and biochemical literature when discussing nonlinear data analysis. Good to know. Very good to know. Okay. Um, so what else do you use if you don't use R squared for nonlinear ones? What can you use? Well, one alternative is to simply see how far off on average your points are from the prediction, right? So like if this is your data point and this is your prediction, just figure out what's that error, sum it up for all of those and then divide by the number of them and you have the standard error of the regression, right? It's the average of the distance away from your curve line. Um, so there's some key differences if you decide to do that. First off, it's not gonna be a percentage. This is now going to have the same units as whatever your dependent variable is in the y-axis. So if you're predicting you know, pH, this has the units of pH, right? right? That's a bad example. If you're predicting, you know, uh, strength, it would have the units of strength, right? So that that's useful, I think. And then it actually tells you, you know, what's the average error? When your model makes a prediction, on average, how far off is it? That's a very interpretable, useful value, whereas an R squared, it's like, well, the better to 100%, the better, right? The closer it is to one, the better, but it's not as interpretable as this. This actually gives you more interpretability. Here they give an example on this website I was following uh, where they show you, you know, looking at BMI and percent body fat, and they show you what the average value is, right? There, that's their curve. But then they also show you what the S, the standard error of the regression, is three and a half percent, right? So which they're showing that it actually can show you what the 95% confidence interval is by using this. So that's actually useful if you want to start talking about how many standard deviations. Um, a way outliers are. This is potentially one way to do that is to think about it in terms of probabilities. Okay. Um, now in, in machine learning and materials informatics, there's a couple other metrics which are very commonly reported. First off, when we predict a property, we build a model, we predict something, you almost always see what are called parity plots. A parity plot is one like this, where you plot like the actual thing that you were trying to predict, and then you here you plot your predicted value. So on your x and y axis, you can see these two different things plotted against one another. And it's common to show a you know, 45 degree line, which would be the ideal scenario. If your model got it perfect, then every time that you predicted something, it would be matched perfectly by the actual value. Um, that's never the case, almost. It shouldn't be. That might actually, it's a red flag if it is, right? Instead, we have something other. And so it's common to show a linear fit through your data. And you can see, you know, we're not exactly on the ideal. Now you'll notice another couple of things here. We show, uh, because there's a whole bunch of data points here and they're all right on top of each other, you don't know how many there are, right? And so you can kind of lose the fact of the site that this is where most of your data is. So it's really trying to get this right. Even though you see data points out here, they are far less uh, dense, right? So by showing histograms on the Y and the X axes, you can really give your viewer a feel for how dense this information is and that's why uh, it's paying attention to that area when it's trying to make its predictions accurately. Okay, uh, you can also show these with a little bit of transparency. That's what I've done as well. You can kind of see that they're transparent. That helps you see where where it's more dense as well. Okay, um, now there are other metrics that are commonly used. Uh, if R squared is just one metric and it's just okay, uh, then you can also see the mean absolute error, right? So again, on this one, you're going to sum up for every single data point. You're going to ask how far is it from the observation, right? your observation minus your model, take the absolute error of that, right? So you're gonna make them all positive and divide by the total number. So this is very akin to what we just saw with the standard error of regression. There's also the mean squared error. This looks almost the same as above. You'll notice the difference that instead of using an absolute value, we're just gonna square the difference. By squaring it, you make sure that there's no negatives. 
and it has the benefit of telling you if something's far off, if there's a big difference, like this data point is really far off of the prediction, then it's going to penalize you more because squared numbers, right, it gets even larger. So this has a good job of helping you pay attention to outliers, right, squaring that, okay? And then root mean squared error brings that back to sub by, you know, you squared it, which made the, the error artificially large. You take the root mean square at the end of that, and that can bring it back to a number which is similar. So again, if you're trying to predict strength, by the time you do root mean squared error, it brings, if, you, you know, if you're plus or minus 15 megapascals, it brings it back into a number which is more easy for us to interpret. So there's some benefit to that. So uh, those are just a couple of the ways that people use for machine learning to establish metrics. I hope that was useful. Um, let's now talk about how we split our data up. Before you actually build your model and you can generate these awesome sort of parity plots, um, let's talk about what data goes here. Is the data that gets plotted here on your parity plot the same stuff that you train on? Or is it different? <laughs> Spoiler alert, it should be different. So let's talk about what that is in our next video on splitting your data up into test, train, and validation sets.